Buenos días a todos. Estimados miembros del Cuerpo Diplomático de la Embajada de Irlanda en México, estimada Anne Enright, autoridades de la UNAM y de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, colegas, alumnos y amigos muy queridos que nos acompañan, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a la ceremonia presencial de instalación de la Cátedra Extraordinaria Evan Bowland and Enright de Estudios Irlandeses de la UNAM. Los estudios irlandeses en la UNAM tuvieron como figura pionera a la doctora Luz Aurora Pimentel, aquí presente, quien desde la, época de, de, desde la década de los 70 impartía el seminario sobre la obra de James Joyce en el posgrado en literatura comparada de nuestra institución. La maestra Argentina Rodríguez, que llegará en unos minutitos, <risa> se hizo cargo años después de continuar con esta tarea dentro del programa de estudios de la licenciatura en letras inglesas y han sido muchas las destacadas figuras de esta facultad que han contribuido a fortalecer y ampliar las labores de docencia, investigación, traducción y creación relacionadas con este campo de estudios. Menciono a manera de ejemplo al maestro Colin White, al maestro Federico Patán, al maestro Hernán Lara Zavala, a la maestra Eva Cruz y al escritor Salvador Elizondo, entre otros. A partir del año 2018, el doctor Mario Murja, mi colega que está en aquel extremo del podio, y yo, Aurora Piñeiro, decidimos impulsar un proyecto que, de manera aún más intensiva, cristalizara los esfuerzos de nuestra comunidad académica en torno a este campo de estudios. Fue así como, con el indispensable apoyo de la rectoría y de la Coordinación de Relaciones y Asuntos Internacionales de la UNAM, que hoy está representada por el doctor Trigo en esta mesa, se logró formalizar la creación de esta Cátedra de Estudios Irlandeses en el año 2021. Cátedra que a su vez fue alojada, o yo diría para ser más enfática, amorosamente cobijada por la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras y por la Embajada de Irlanda en México. Instancias que han apoyado y promovido las diversas actividades que cada año llevamos a cabo. A esta iniciativa se unieron, en el mismo espíritu de generosidad, las herederas de la obra de Evan Boland, así como la escritora Anne Enright, que hoy nos acompaña y quienes aceptaron fungir como las figuras emblemáticas de la cátedra. La cátedra tiene como objetivos fundamentales afianzar y promover el intercambio académico y cultural entre Irlanda y México. Las actividades hasta ahora realizadas se han caracterizado por estar abiertas a toda la comunidad universitaria, así como a todos los interesados en el estudio y difusión de las aportaciones de Irlanda en los ámbitos de la literatura y las artes. De igual manera, la Cátedra ha buscado fortalecer un diálogo más amplio y de doble vía, donde las obras académicas y artísticas latinoamericanas también se han vuelto protagónicas. En este sentido, hemos trabajado en equipo con las otras cátedras de estudios irlandeses de América Latina, alojadas en la USPI, en Brasil, así como en la USAL, la Universidad de La Plata y la Universidad Nacional de La Pampa, en Argentina. Este fructífero intercambio ha generado una nueva iniciativa que se encuentra en proceso de aprobación y que consiste en la creación de una alianza transnacional de Cátedras de Estudios Irlandeses de América Latina, auspiciada no solo por las universidades referidas, sino también por las embajadas irlandesas de los países mencionados. Me llena de orgullo compartir este recorrido con ustedes, refrendar públicamente mi compromiso con este proyecto, expresar mi más sincero agradecimiento a todos los involucrados e invitarlos a participar en las muchas actividades que nos esperan y que serán anunciadas no solo por las vías que hemos utilizado hasta ahora, sino en la nueva página web de la Cátedra, que muy pronto estará disponible en la plataforma digital de nuestra facultad y que ha recibido el apoyo también del Immigrant Support Program del Departamento de Asuntos Exter Exteriores del Gobierno de Irlanda. Sin más preámbulos, cedo el micrófono a Ruth McKenna, 
segunda secretaria y cónsul de la Embajada de Irlanda en México, quien a nombre de la excelentísima embajadora Neif von Heinitz dirigirá unas palabras. Muchas gracias. Good morning. So as Aurora said, my name is Ruth McKenna. I'm the consul at the Irish Embassy here in Mexico City. Unfortunately, um, our ambassador was called by President Chavez in Costa Rica to present her credit credentials. Um, so she had to travel to Costa Rica at the last moment. So that's why, why I'm here today speaking on her behalf. So before I kind of share some remarks, I'd like to extend thanks, first of all, to uh, Dr. Francisco José Primo Taveira, el director de la Coordinación de Relaciones y Asuntos Internacionales, a la doctora Mary Frances Rodríguez Van Gort, directora de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, a la doctora Naif Anaya Ferreira, secretaria académica de la Facultad también de Filosofía y Letras, y obviamente, I would, I'm kind of switching back to English now, I don't know the titles in Spanish, sorry. Um, I would also, of course, like to acknowledge um, the, the, the hard work and commitment of both Professor Aurora Pinheiro and Professor Mario Murcia. Um, you know, they, they have been really excellent partners for the Irish Embassy uh, since my arrival, at least in Mexico City, uh, two years ago, and for the, for the Embassy before then, thanks to their ambition and vision. Their hard work and, and their love of Irish literature, you know, this fantastic project of the Irish Studies Chair has, has come together. So, thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, important as well to, I know we're going to hear from her shortly, but to extend our warm welcome and thanks to Anne and Wright, who has travelled all the way from Ireland to be with us here today. It's a very long journey. Um, the jet lag is, is quite difficult, so we really appreciate her presence here to, to, to officially inaugurate um, the Chair. I think and another thing just for, for us that you know we take we take a great pride that the first Irish Studies Chair in Mexico is here in this very prestigious university. Um, I was here yesterday uh, with my colleague and a group of, of Irish artists. I mean it's a really amazing campus. The the library was designed by Juan O'Gorman, who is an architect of Irish um, of Irish descent. His father was an Irish immigrant to, to Mexico. So I think there's something really special happening here at UNA where we have these artistic links and their roles that the Irish Studies Chair is really going to contribute to the, the flourishing of academia around Irish literature, the study of Irish literature and the promotion of Irish literature. So I, I think it goes without saying that storytelling is really at the heart of, of who Irish people are and, and how we connect with each other and how we connect with the world. A hundred years ago, uh, Ulysses was published basically the, the, the defining literary monument of the 20th century and possibly the most influential Irish artwork or, or piece of literature ever produced. But really, not that much has changed since then. Um, you know, we're very proud to see that Irish contemporary writing is flourishing. Uh, there are you know, new voices coming out all, all of the time in Ireland. Um, and it's, it's really amazing to see how those Irish writers are resonating with international audiences. Uh, just last week, I was in Guadalajara with the ambassador and the entire embassy team. It was pretty hectic, but we brought um, Louise O'Neill and Michelle Gallen here to Mexico. We also had Colin McCann uh, participating virtually, and it was really amazing to see in universities and colleges across the city of Guadalajara, they were constantly packed by students who had this hunger to, to learn more about Irish literature, and the stories that they're telling are, are really resonating with audiences here. Um, I think uh, it's just, you know, it, it's a real pleasure to see that deep appreciation and I think, you know, here with you today, um, it's really fantastic to have Anne Enright with us. She's one of Ireland's most accomplished writers. Her novels, um, her short stories and, and her non-fiction, you know, are nationally recognised but also internationally recognised and we're really privileged to have her, um, you know, be here with us and, and support the chair and, and also lend her name to, to the chair. Um, I, I would also just like to, I, I think Mary is going to say a, a little bit more shortly about Yvonne Boland, but um, you know, she sadly passed away not so long ago, um, and she really is one of Ireland's uh, best known and most loved poets. Um, she's particularly important to the Irish Foreign Service, um, she, she, she had a very close connection to the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, 
her father, Frederick Boland, was um, a distinguished um, Irish Irish ambassador for many years. Um, and I think just, you know, kind of on that note, a, another thing to mention is that she, she wrote a poem to mark the centenary um, of the first, the, um, sorry, so in 2018 she wrote a poem to mark the, the granting of suffrage or the granting of the right to vote to women in Ireland and that was a poem that was actually read in the United Nations um, at a special ceremony. Um, so I think it's just really interesting to see how Irish writers are contributing not only to cultural life but also to political life. There's a really very vibrant um, writing culture and appreciation of literature in Ireland and it's something that we're so pleased to see shared between Mexico and Ireland. Um, I think just the, the point on the United Nations is, is interesting to mention, and I'm, I'm not sure how many students in the room might be aware of this, but you know, Ireland and Mexico are two countries, we're not also united by the appreciation of culture, but there's a lot of things that we stand for um, that brings us together. Um, we have a really long and successful history of cooperating together um, in the multilateral forum. So in the United Nations, the United Nations Security Council, both Mexico and Ireland are serving as non-permanent members, there's a lot of jargon, um, but we're both serving there together um, and we've been working together, uh, co-chairing um, a, a forum on women, peace and security, which are issues that Eva Bowman speaks to in, in, in her poetry. Um, and I just think it's, it's really important to just kind of take a moment to think about how, you know, we're using literature um, to promote the, the shared values and how literature can really act as a, a bridge um, between, you know, Mexico and Ireland and also, um, you know, through, across Latin America. I know the, the chair has been very successful in collaborating with other <coughs> chairs in the region. So that's really all I, I kind of wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for being here and I hope you in, enjoy the event. Muy buenos días, tengan todas y todos ustedes. Un placer estar en esta facultad. Eh, estimada Ruth McKenna, cónsul de la Embajada de Irlanda en México. Estimada doctora Marie Frances Rodríguez Van Gort, directora de esta facultad, estimados miembros del Presidium y de la comunidad académica de esta facultad, es un gusto para mí estar presente hoy como coordinador de Relaciones de Asuntos Internacionales de nuestra universidad en la ceremonia presencial de instalación de la Cátedra Extraordinaria Ivan Bolan Art Enright de Estudios Irlandeses de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Siempre es motivo de orgullo que un nuevo espacio de enseñanza, aprendizaje, investigación y difusión, como lo han sido sin excepción las cátedras extraordinarias de esta casa de estudios, se sume a las labores críticas y analíticas que, desde hace ya décadas, llevan a cabo con excelencia, vigor y rigor esos valiosos instrumentos de intercambio académico e intelectual. Calificar de nueva a esta cátedra de estudios irlandeses es, sin embargo, un tanto inexacto. Hace menos de cinco años, la doctora Aurora Piñeiro y el doctor Mario Murguía, aquí presentes con nosotros, concibieron la posibilidad de un entorno universitario que pudiese estar dedicado al estudio y la difusión de la cultura y la literatura irlandesas. Desde ese momento, y gracias al entusiasta y generoso apoyo de la dirección y de la Secretaría Académica de esta facultad, así como al importante impulso y compromiso por parte de la Embajada de la República de Irlanda en México, un muy activo grupo de académicos, escritores y estudiantes se ha abocado a promover intercambios invaluables entre dos naciones con culturas monumentales, la irlandesa y la mexicana. Sin duda, una muestra patente de estos esfuerzos es la feliz y auspiciosa presencia de la misma Anne Enright, a quien tengo el placer de dar la bienvenida en nombre de la Coordinación de Relaciones Internacionales a esta facultad y a la UNAM. 
Esta primera visita de la ganadora del premio Booker a nuestra universidad representa una oportunidad extraordinaria para adentrarnos en la obra y en el pensamiento de una de las escritoras más relevantes y singulares de Irlanda de nuestros días. Convivir con ella significa también contar con el testimonio vivo de una tradición literaria tan antigua como vibrante, tan influyente como plural y polifónica. Hace apenas un momento dije que Anne Enright había ganado el Booker, uno de los premios literarios más prestigiados en el mundo de habla inglés. En efecto, ese galardón se le otorgó en el 2007 por su conmovedora e impactante novela El Encuentro, como se ha traducido su título al español. Allí en ese texto, una de las voces principales afirma que está lista para que la conozcan. Haciendo eco de esa voz, puedo decir hoy, en esta universidad estamos listos para que Anne Enright nos conozca. Igualmente, puedo afirmar que nosotros también estamos listos para conocerla, aún más de cerca e incluso mejor de lo que nos permite ya entrever su brillante obra, que incluye siete novelas, numerosos cuentos y otros tantos escritos de muy variada naturaleza. Hago votos porque la cátedra que lleva su nombre, así como el nombre de la memorable poeta Ivan Boland, sigan siendo, como lo es ya hoy, el vínculo esencial de muchos más encuentros, conocimientos y aún re-reconocimientos entre México e Irlanda. Dear Anne Enright, Your presence at this National University of Mexico is highly valued and appreciated. Many thanks for sharing your vast experience in the literary field with us. And most of all for taking the long trip from Dublin to Mexico City to spend some time here with us. Let's hope you enjoy your time in Mexico City and at this National University and you become one of our academic members for so many years to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Rigo. Uh, y ahora voy a dar la palabra a la doctora Mary Frances Rodríguez Van Gogh, directora de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras. Hola a todas y a todos, es para mí un honor dar a ustedes la más cordial bienvenida a esta ceremonia de instalación presencial de la Cátedra Evan Bolan and Enred de Estudios Irlandeses y contar con la participación de la muy distinguida novelista Anne Enred. Welcome to Mexico Atunan, quien nos honra con su visita. Agradezco la presencia de la secretaria y cónsul, la señora Ruth Maquena, y del personal de la embajada que aquí nos acompaña. También la presencia del doctor Trigo, Francisco Trigo, coordinador de Relaciones y Asuntos Internacionales de la UNAM, a los doctores Aurora Piñeiro y Mario Muglia, que nos acompañan, representantes de esta cátedra, así como a nuestra querida doctora Luz Aurora Pimentel, maestra y a la maestra Argentina Rodríguez, que nos acompañará en un momento las cuales son decanas del Colegio de Letras Modernas y pues muy bienvenidos al resto de los asistentes la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras ha sido pionera en los estudios sobre la cultura y la literatura de Irlanda a lo largo de varias décadas además de cursos y seminarios especializados sobre autores emblemáticos como Oscar Wilde y James Joyce un grupo de profesores preparó y tradujo dos importantes antologías una lengua injertada, poesía irlandesa del siglo XX y Raíces en la Tierra, Irlanda en su ensayo literario. Estas obras, estas traducciones, contribuyeron de forma notable a difundir la magnífica producción literaria de ese país y a dar a conocer un panorama amplio y a la vez profundo de sus complejas identidades en movimiento. Durante los últimos cuatro años, la Embajada de Irlanda en México nos ha otorgado un apoyo invaluable en la organización de una variedad de actividades académicas que han contribuido a la formación de estudiantes y académicos del Colegio de Letras Modernas y del Posgrado de Letras. De estas actividades, los congresos internacionales 
Joyce Without Borders, celebrado en 2019 de forma presencial, y Joyce in Latin America, celebrado en línea en 2021, anticipan ya las dinámicas que enriquecerán a nuestras comunidades en el futuro. Espero que la sinergia que impulsa la instalación de la cátedra el día de hoy se mantenga por mucho tiempo y les doy la más cordial bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Quiero simplemente decir que me siento privilegiada de formar parte de este día tan especial. Como se mencionó ya en la facultad, la literatura irlandesa ha sido un elemento importantísimo dentro de nuestros, dentro de nuestros planes de estudio y hemos tenido la suerte de contar con profesoras y profesores que se han especializado no solo en la obra de figuras como Swift, Wilde o Joyce, sino de otros autores más contemporáneos como Iris Murdoch y Seamus Heaney. Sin embargo, tener una cátedra extraordinaria de estudios irlandeses con el nombre de Ivan Boland y de Anne Enright abre un horizonte completamente diferente que permite que nuestros estudiantes tengan perspectivas nuevas y desafiantes de la cultura contemporánea de Irlanda y a la vez que comprendan la importancia de una historia compleja y paradójica, con tantos puntos de afinidad con nuestra propia historia. Como estudiantes y estudiosos mexicanos de literaturas en lenguas extranjeras, siempre corremos el peligro de aceptar acríticamente ciertos cánones literarios que muchas veces perpetúan imágenes limitadas y fijas de la historia y de las relaciones entre los países. Con su magnífica obra, Bolan y Enright nos ayudan a cuestionar las tendencias hegemónicas. Nos impulsan a pensar sobre el peligro de escuchar y aceptar una sola historia, como dijo otro autor hace unas décadas. No solo abre nuestra mirada a paisajes diferentes, a historias enterradas, a perspectivas y conciencias dobles y múltiples que incluyen las de las mujeres y los subalternos sino que también nos llevan a establecer vínculos entre, diferentes, eh, entre diversos referentes, referentes que desplazan las nociones simplistas de centro y periferia y que nos incitan a pensar sobre los aspectos tóxicos de la historia para parafrasear un verso de bola. En una época en la que resurgen ciertas visiones fundamentalistas de la realidad, agradecemos que poetas como Bolan novelistas como Anne Enright nos dejen ver que la vida está llena de matices y sutilezas y que mediante la ironía es posible cuestionar la cerrazón de los prejuicios. Me congratulo de que hoy se lleve a cabo la instalación de la cátedra y le deseo una larga vida. Muchas gracias. to Dr. Mario Murja, who is a professor in the Department of Letters and English of the SUAE and a responsible of the Cathedral of Irlandese Studies. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. And, of course, I would like to thank the people who are here today. Today, I would like to thank the people who are here today. En un poema intitulado The Mother Tongue o La Lengua Materna, la gran poeta irlandesa Evan Boland habla de barreras y de las formas que bien pueden existir para superarlas. Dos de los vehículos para lograr eso, que al final constituyen uno solo, son la lengua y el pensamiento. La voz de Boland dice ahí, hablo con lengua vívida. Usaré hoy esa imagen para pasar con algo de gracia si acaso del español al inglés, porque de los nacionales que estamos hoy aquí, a mí me toca hablar en esa lengua. En junio de 2021, 
while the COVID pandemic was still raging. We held an online avatar of something called the Joys in Latin America International Conference. That was in preparation for the centennial, for the centennial of Ulysses this year. Amid those celebrations on the 10th of June, the abandonment and enright Irish studies chair was officially, if virtually, installed. With invaluable support from the authorities at UNAM, the School of Philosophy and Literature, and the Irish Embassy in Mexico, most of us who are here today on this panel could share back then, on screen, the joy of creating a new environment for the study and promotion of Irish culture and literature in Mexico and the Spanish-speaking world. I am overjoyed that we are all here in person to relive that experience truly together. Last year, we had the pleasure of hearing from Dublin, was it Dublin? I can't remember. Um, from Dublin and Enright's illuminating words. We feel privileged to have her here today in the flesh. There was a tinge of sadness on that occasion, however. The other emblematic figure of the chair, Evan Bowen, had passed away almost exactly one year earlier. Miss Sarah Casey, a daughter and a representative of the Evan Bowen state, generously and very movingly shared with us her impressions on the creation of the chair. To honor Evan Bowen's immense legacy, I would like to quote an essay by her titled very suggestively, Reading as Intimidation. Almost at the end of the essay, Bowen claims the following. When I was young, I thought of aesthetics as an abstract code. I learned later that it was a human one. I learned it belonged everywhere and to no one person, which means it can be a common possession. It is my personal belief that the very existence of the Van Gogh and Henry Irish Studies Chair is proof that there is profound truth in Bowen's insight on aesthetics and by extension on art and literature. After having read most of Anne Enright's novels, short stories, and quite a few interviews, I suspect she shares that vision too. So, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to give you Anne Enright. honoured by this initiative by the Department of Irish Studies to establish a chair in the name of Yvan Boland and to have my name joined with her in this way. Yvan is a steady light, a wonderful and righteous poet who is utterly clear and always kind. My thanks to the Head of Foreign Affairs at now, Dr. Trigo, for his well, warm welcome to the Dean of the School of Philosophy and Literature, Dr. Mary Frances Rodriguez from Gort, to Academic Secretary Dr. Anaya, and to Ruth McKenna from the Embassy for representing the Ambassador so well here. My thanks especially to Aurora Pinheiro for her abundant energy, drive, and vision in bringing all this to fruition with the help of her colleague, Dr. Mario Mur Murcia. The Chair, I'm sure, I, 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 I know, has been welcomed also by my colleagues in UCD as a strengthening of the international ties between University College Dublin and this remarkable place, which is UNA. Uh, Ireland is, compared to Mexico, a tiny country, but we have much in common, and we understand each other in a way that I think is intuitive. Uh, neither of us is an imperial power. We both have enjoyed a Catholic tradition. Both <laughs> countries use and continue to use literary and artistic culture as a way to define the constantly emerging nation state. I am incredibly fortunate to be part of this small, agile, and urgent writing tradition. 
and I'm especially proud, and I'm sure Ivan Boland would agree here, in the recognition afforded in recent years to the work of female writers, which has resulted in a great flourishing of work by Irish women on the global stage. I look forward to discussing two of these women work, Sally Rooney's and Laura McBride, at a seminar tomorrow. We, and a bit of Joyce, we can't leave them out. Okay, actually quite a lot of Joyce. <laughs> so, uh, Aurora, you know you can't say no to Aurora Pinheiro, that must be, there should be a, a warning. But at the bottom of her email, she could say, <laughs> this email comes from a person who will not be refused. Um, and so charming was her invitation last year to the Zoom uh, inauguration of the chair, but I wrote a special piece that was quite quite close to my heart. Uh, I, I feel so honoured. Uh, I want to all produce some new work for you here now. I finished a novel last Wednesday, uh, and it hasn't been read by anyone. Ain't that my husband here and there, my agent? One person has read this whole novel. Right. So, uh, I thought I might give it a lash, see what you think. Um, so, brand new work uh, for you here, as um, just a small mark of my gratitude to you all. Um, so, the book is called The Wren, The Wren, uh, and it's got three generations in it. The first generation is a poet, an Irish poet, Phil McDara, uh, who's dead and gone and left his family when his wife got sick. Very interested in men who leave when their wives get sick. <laughs> I heard a writer once say, Yes, we were married, but she got sick and too long. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happens. Anyway, so this is a small seed for the writer who, who doesn't do that stuff with doing his writing. Uh, so we don't see much of Phil, we do see his work. And his daughter, Carmel, at the age of 50, sees a little interview. Uh, of a man that she hasn't met in, in decades, and the interview is reported and, uh, and it's on the internet, and the internet is produced. So the first piece is Carmel looking at her father online. The interview was recorded in America, it must have been 1978 or 1979, when Phil was teaching there. A television studio, cavernously dark, in the centre of it, a coffee, uh, a coffee table of glass and chrome, a pair of microphone stands crisscrossed. At either end of this gleaming crooks, two men, who looked older than they might have done, talked to each other from tan leather swivel chairs. Carmel tapped the space bar and let them go. The men's voices were conversational and clear, but the words came from behind some faint scrim of sound, and she ramped the volume up to check what it might be. There was the white hiss of electronic decay, and beyond that again, the shadows of other voices, as though some older recording were breaking through. Or the tape had magnetized itself on the spool somehow, and the men's words were overlaid by their own future words from further down the road. This acoustic bleed was one indicator of the era. The other was the way her father smoked throughout, leaning forward to dab the stub at a fat crystal ashtray. Till Phil's tie was not straight, his jacket was the usual disgrace. He twisted forward, jerked back, he hunched over the chair and pushed the tweed away to scratch a spot on his ribs. There he was, eight long years after the whipped off sheet and the broken chair the day he left them. Dado. Phil's spoke about bluebells, the difference of the American woods to the spongy bogs of Offaly, and how he missed the wren there. He missed the smallness of Irish birds, and the wren especially, who is the king of them all. He mentioned courting his wife, who had walked with him through Bluebell Woods when he was a young man. She was from Dublin and unfamiliar with the countryside, and that in a way was what his early poetry was for. It was his gift to her. A posy. No, what was the word? A nosegay. They lived together in Dublin for some time, he said, but she got sick, unfortunately, and the marriage did not survive. Carmel pressed pause, went back. To Natalie and the marriage, he looked sadly down, did not survive. Unfortunately, said Carmel. 
speaking the word aloud into the room had break some difficulty she had sitting at her own di dining table watching her dead father online. Maybe it was the accent. Carl's mind had emptied out at the sound of it or was loud with some blank she couldn't get around. So taken was she by the way he said ram for ram. She failed to understand a single word of what he'd said next. The ram, the ram, the king of all birds. St. Stephen's Day was stuck in the furs. This was a song that Phil always loved, for the fact it was a little vicious. He used to sing it every day, every year on St. Stephen's Day, which was the slow day after Christmas. And Carmel was back in their house in Dunleary, watching her father stage his annual kitchen-shaking riot. Phil left the house by the front door and came in at the back with coal dust on his face and their, mother, and their mother's shopping bag on his head, the wicker handles hooked over his ears. He banged pots through sheets of newspaper, climbed up in a chair and swung the sweeping brush around the ceiling light which clanged and swung up at the kettle and down at the pan and give us a penny to bury the ram. <coughs> at the age of five or six, Carmel had cheered and shrieked as she was supposed to do. She did not know that they had killed the little wren in the song, or the drolene, as her father called the bird in Irish. Droolin, droolin, where's your nest? Tis in the bush that I love best. There was something lewd about that line, about the bush, and she thought about it now. One time, the stick he was waving had a dead mouse tied to the end of it by the tail. Was that possible? That he bopped them each on the head with a dead mouse? Carmel used to think she had imagined such things. When people told her she had no imagination, she thought, yes, I do. I imagined all of that. On the computer screen, her father looked oddly young and also worn out. The recording was made two years before he died, though he never knew he was sick. The autopsy would discover cancer of the esophagus, but up to the last, it was just a lifestyle. Phil had a drinker's stomach, a smoker's cough, he was killed by an early and catastrophic bleed to the lung. And when he went, Carmel thought, a room in her head filled with earth. She paused the thing and lifted her head. There was a ticking somewhere in the room which was gone as soon as she tried to hear it. Perhaps it had been on the tape. She checked her phone. Nell, her daughter, was coming home later in the week. She promised to call and tell her which day. It was hard not to want the sound of her daughter's voice. Now, though sometimes it was weirdly difficult to identify, especially when Nell was a girl. Um, Mum? Yes? A child's voice lacked that recognisable something, the grain or texture that made it fully human. Yes? Are you alright? Sometimes it was like talking to a doll. Did you find the address? What did the teacher say? Are you coming home? Nell said yes, or Nell said no. When the two of them spoke in this way, Carmel did not know what they just shared, apart from the fact that they were apart. Are you all right? I'm fine, Mum. Where are you? Are you coming home? Now she watched the televised black slit of her father's mouth as language slipped out of it on curls of exhaled lucky strike. Phil's hands shaped the air in front of his rotting chest as he talked of the little Irish wren. And there's just a whisper of alcohol in there, softening his tongue and wetting those mischievous, fond eyes. It was so easy to hate this man. The facts spoke for themselves. It was still hard to dislike him. And it was devastatingly easy to love him, to flock around and keen when he died, because all the words died with him. On screen, the Irish poet Phil McDowell was talking about the work of Robert Frost, whose voice had called him to the forests of New England in order to record the falling leaves. But he missed awfully, he missed the little Irish wren. He spoke about Bluebell Woods, his wife, her illness. She got sick, he looked down, unfortunately, and the marriage did not survive. He glanced up with wet eyes. Why was that? He was looking for sympathy, our sympathy. Carmel's sympathy, everyone's sympathy. Poor Phil. The interviewer viewed him with angled seriousness and recalled across his legs. This man wore droopy, heavy rimmed glasses that made him look intellectual yet modern, bookish, but also a bit of a player. And Whitman, he asked. 
Ah, Whitman, said Phil, catching his toe. No, no, Whitman was the opposite of Irish. He was all the things an Irishman could never hope to be. Carmel had forgotten Phil's rueful jokes, the way he could mock the world with his fake sorrow. He was so disarming and slightly creepy. But she could barely form that thought before it was gone again, as if it was as if Carmel could remember the burr of his voice inside his. It was as if Carmel could remember the burr of his voice inside her body, humming along the bone. Listening to him now at a distance of more than 40 years, his daughter felt again as though she held them in either hand. The two weighed some syllables he gave to her for a name, Carmel. He said it as though she was the center of the sweet, she was the salt honey dripped across your ice cream. This is the poem, the wren, the wren, for Carmel. Berry, glance, leaf, twisting into bird, high-tailed from head to hand, she was mine. The wren poked out from the cup my fist and was still. Her eye, honour bright to my vast eye, the whir of her pulse ecstatic. The wren, the wren was a panic of feathered air in my opening hand, so fierce and light I did not feel the push of her ascent away from me. In a blur of love to love indistinguishable, my palm pin pricked my earthbound heart of her love's weight relieved, and oh, my life, my daughter, the faraway sky is cold and very blue. Finished reciting, Phil dropped his head. The man with the droopy glasses blinked slowly and kept his eyes closed. Then he stirred and asked if Phil was working on an American cycle of poems. Oh, no, no, said Phil. He tried to write about other places he really had, but really, he only ever wrote about Ireland. I never left, he said. Carmel slapped the space bar and looked at him. She tapped again to let her, her dead father slip back into speech. You can't leave a place like that, Phil said. It's always with you. She froze him there, let out a bit of a laugh, and heard herself do it, a snort of air coming out of her face. She should go out into the garden, she thought, where the air was full of noises. You have a great understanding of women, the interviewer said, apropos of nothing. I think I do, said Phil. Their sorrows, yes. What goes on in their minds? Well, there's nothing so necessary as the female heart. A lot of writers, a lot of people get that a little bit wrong. Okay, so that's, that's Carl and her dad. And here is the daughter, Nell, who's out exploring ideas about love. Some of the language here is, is, is young. <laughs> She's young. So uh, she finds her, yeah, her friend Mal, who's gay, in Utrecht. She's had a bad relationship with a nasty man. Go figure. Okay. I find Mal in Utrecht doing a master's and smoking too much weed. He lives overlooking a canal, or maybe it's a river. He has a bicycle, though you can also walk anywhere here. So we walk. Dutch people leave their curtains open and you can see into their living rooms as you pass on the street. And in the center of Utrecht, these rooms are perfect. Every window frames a still life. Mal says Dutch children go wherever they want so long as they're home for dinner. Also, one night we drink late and the barman won't serve Mal's friend Jamal because he is not white. Happened. The first night we rolled up and settled into Mal's fourth floor apartment, which is one huge room with rafters running up to a point like an upturned boat. Mal says it's cheap because of the noise from the cafes along the water. But I sneak around down the line and I think it really isn't cheap. And that Mal has been totally funded by his property speculating father. The wall over his desk is pinned with pictures of those futuristic buildings with hanging gardens and trees on balconies. And I ask, how come they never get built? Well, yeah, he says. It's just trees, not exactly high tech. Say that in a Dutch accent, he says. I'd really enjoy that. When I saw him at the train station, we hugged. And I remembered how he was so skinny and long. He has a fresh ink of a bee above his thumb and an open safety 
in tattooed on his forearm. Also, he pulled down his collar so I could see the letter A in cursive on the base of his neck. Who's A? I said. Annie. This is a guy who puts his little sister's initial above his collarbone. He's the sweetest person and I love him like he never faded out on me, never wandered off and erased all our good times. How's Lily? Who are you working for now? Still freelancing, I say. Great. For some reason I feel disbelieved. Later I tell him I broke up with someone. Hard to say if you are even a thing, I say, but anyway it's done. I, I don't know. He was a bit maybe coercive. Mal looks away from me and says, Oh you, we are smoking some mild, sweet-natured kush, which he passes over. He was just very indifferent, I say, and kind of mean. My kind of guy, says Mal. Yeah, well, the sounds of cafes and bars below. There are people in kayaks on the water, even though it's dark, and everyone out there is having a fun time. I was in, I was in love. I say defensively, and he takes another tip. I really was. We talk about people from home. Mal doesn't see anyone much. He rarely checks his phone. He's a funny boy, Mal. He takes what's in front of him and leaves the rest behind. I tell him Lily is in a relationship with an older woman in London, and I think she's a bit of a bully. Shona went into IT and fell in love with a guy in IT, which seems impossible when you say it all in one go. But she, uh, she's really keen, diving for the dress, scouting island venues, quote unquote, for the big day. Romance is clearly something she feels she can afford. Or am I just jealous? Because I can't afford it, that's for sure. The thing you don't understand, he says, me, okay, women. The thing women don't understand is that love and sex are opposite things. Oh, shut up. True. You ever had a crush, I say? Oh, like you would not believe. Well then, I'm just saying that my love is a higher function and I'm all for that, yes, please. May we all get there someday. Meanwhile, sex is a beast. This makes me laugh, even though I don't want to laugh. There's some extra hit in this stuff and I can't stop the giggles. They well up, burst out of my face in slow motion in a slow motion peristaltic wave over and over. I'm a broken hearted woman trapped in a body that finds everything hilarious. It feels a bit like vomiting. The fuck is this stuff? And Mal says, good evening, you trenched. An unspecified amount of time later, I remember what I want to say. No, it's not. But Mal is still together, or at least together enough to insist Love requires, he pauses, looking up for the right term, two acts of submission. And sex, he pauses again, really doesn't. On Saturday evening, Mal goes up to the big city and he comes back in the door secretly pleased like he's just killed someone and got away with it. Sunday is all come down, he wakes late, eats three pot noodles in a row, then lies down for a long existential wrangle on the sofa. Mal is studying urban spaces. He'll end up working for some developer, getting his ugly pile of bricks past the planning authorities. But what can you do? People have to live someplace. You might as well plant them a few fucking trees. Right. You think you can walk away, but you can't, because there isn't anywhere else to go. Right. So yeah, I think, yeah, you might as well plant them a few fucking trees. I'm sitting on a slim, trendy, egg-type chair a long scoop of orange leather on a swivel podium, an object beyond the dreams of any Irish landlord. And I see a future for Mal, because it's a bit like his past, but I do not see a future for me. Mal tells me a story he read somewhere about a planet where everyone is the same gender, let's call it May. So they're all equal, and they're all happy, until one of them starts to like another one a little more than the rest. He wants this particular guy's company. He wants his special attention. He starts to miss being with them. It's possible he's even shock horror attracted. And this feeling spreads to his system like a blush. And it's more than a blush. It's a kind of metabolic shift. His body starts to change. And this is just mortifying because everyone can see it happening, especially the person they're crushing on. He's just embarrassed to see the, the effect he's having on this guy. And that is subject to 
who is now also subject to public ridicule. After a few weeks, the one with the crush is fully transitioned to a different gender. Let's call it female. And some male sharks them, maybe not even the male they wanted in the first place, and they get pregnant, and that is how the species propagates. So the trick on this planet is not to fall in love. Not ever. Because if that happens, you are literally fucked. <laughs> huh, I said. You are the pussy. No, I get it. Thank you. I do get it. And you might like being the pussy, because that can also be nice. <laughs> Back in college, Mal used to say the golden rule is never sh shag someone who has more problems than you. But he spent six months with a guy who was so fucked up he couldn't be near it for too long. This guy, Paul, was lit up by damage, super skinny, lip chewing the lot. And any time you saw them together, they bickered and bitched like something out of the 1990s. What about Paul? Is that love? Oh, Christ, is now. I don't know. I couldn't fix all that. I couldn't. What? That was really hard. Now Mal is going to bondage clubs at the weekend. And I say, that is so exciting, can I come? I'd love to see some, whatever, piss play. But I also don't mean it, and I worry about it. I worry he might get hurt by being hurt. I worry, I cannot help it, that it will make him less of a person in the long run. It's not like that, he says. Why not? Just, you go in the door, and it is what it is, and then you leave. In the morning, Mal goes to class and I walk the streets taking photos. I buy a ticket for the Cathedral Tower, which is, they say, the tallest in the Netherlands. And then I have a panic attack inside this tower, entombed in its stone walls, a hundred metres above the sane and lovely city of Utrecht. There are 465 steps, and it happens in step number 440, or thereabouts. My journey upwards starts fine. A beautiful tower room at the door in the corner to a narrow stairway which turns at right angles on stone steps to a high space, soaring windows on either side, and in the middle, a massive wooden frame holding the bells. People duck onto the beams to stand inside a metal cloche to touch a clapper as long as a man. I do this too, to know their weight and balance, to feel the hum inside the metal walls. I ding with a knuckle and think of, of sound as a force that might knock you down. The next level up has many cogs and gears, a rotating, a rotating brass drum like the giant contents of a music box. Another frame of bells operated by a keyboard hooked up to cords and pulleys. This steampunk monster is, a sign tells me, the carillon. Finally then, the spiral staircase to the roof, which appears to be inside the wall. A single file twist around a slender pole of stone with not enough room to pass if you were to meet someone coming down. There's barely enough space to put both feet on the narrowing slice of each step. A really fat person might get wedged in here, I think, and then I feel very increasingly fat. I turn and turn around a central access, and I don't feel I'm climbing higher so much as winding tighter, wringing myself out. I can't breathe. The couple behind me is Polish, perhaps, and behind them are voices that sound American. I fill the staircase to bursting. I am an international impediment. Poles turn back to say, moment, please, and below them, an American voice says, mom. Below me, the stairway clogs up and clogs up some more. I'm really working my lungs now. I think I might be able to stagger up sideways with my back against the wall, but I worry I'll hit my head on the roof. Even though I know the roof will rise with me as I go, because the roof is just the underside of the ascending steps on the next twist round. My body does not understand this. My body thinks the roof is getting lower. My body wants to crawl, and after a small time, I allow it to sink down, reach out with my hands, use my left leg, left leg, like a demented half crab, one step after another, up out into the open air. I stand in a wire cage stretched between decorative gothic stone. You can see the city below and the flatness of the countryside in every direction. The American family looks out on the Netherlands. The Polish couple look out. The wire cage empties and fills again, empties and fills, while I focus on the rational Dutch horizon line.
This view has been available since 1382. On a fine day, you can see both Amsterdam and Rotterdam. I think of the far skyline slowly scribbled in with new buildings over the centuries. The breeze is nice. The third or fourth time the place empties out, I empty out too, following a neat, probably Korean, middle-aged foursome. The wall is under my right hand this time, and this feels better to me, though I can still only use one foot repeatedly. As I go down, I say the word carry along over to myself over and over again. Carry along, carry along, carry along. At the bottom of this awful screw, the carillon is more antique and lovely than before. I'm walking through a musical instrument, I'm inside it. Another level down, the big bells are splendid again. I stand looking up at the frame on which they depend, my heart in a flurry of exaltation. I think that maybe I should stop smoking Mal's fearsome Dutch weed. I don't know if I suffer from claustrophobia or vertigo, a fear of towers, a fear of spiral staircases. Why is all anxiety always described as a spiral? I have body dysmorphia, I have panic, I have issues. But I also think that beauty is to blame, because without beauty, there would be no fear. How do I phrase this? The machine of the tower has tipped me into another place. The fear I have is the fear of angels. It is not terror, but awe. I wait until there is no one on the narrow, narrow last staircase which I negotiate on my bum, not because I'm afraid of falling or of the people behind me, because, but because I couldn't give a damn anymore. I have discovered the angelic. I reach the big room, I go down the broad stairs and saunter out of there, breathing light and air. Back in Mal's flat I say, I love you, but I have to go. And when he looks up from his desk, I think Mal is a bit of an angel too. Not yet, he says. Soon. I look up fear of angels. Is it a, is it a phobia? And I land in Christian internet. This is a scary place. Which tells me that the first words out of every angel's mouth are, do not be afraid. Every angel that ever appeared, fear not, fear not. From the train side, Mal and I continue our conversation about love. I know what I want to say to him now. Love is not a higher function. It is the first function. It is the first thing we know. It sends me a meme, a quote from some Japanese writer set against a pretty sunset for some reason. It says, the masochist is always in control. Thank you.